Tatiana was writing something on paper. She looked away from her work and turned to the three people in the room, frowning. Tiana asked why they weren't practicing going through dungeons and raising their levels. She added that it was a waste of skills. She said that they have been lounging around for days now. Darkfeather was looking out the window at the birds. Tilly's, lying on the couch, said that there was a sale going on right now and she would use this chance to buy some gear. Ruko, also lying on the couch, laughed and said that this comic is very funny. Tiana said irritably that she can tolerate Ruko sitting here, but the other two aren't even members of Nebulous. Tilly's told her not to be so particular. Darkfeather said he wanted to see how many birds he could kill with one shot. Ruko continued to laugh at the comic. Tiana yelled about how if they want to lounge around in her place, they need to join Nebulous first. Tilly's replied that the three of them teamed up and had recently executed their plans to level up ahead of schedule. She said that they've also been fighting in the arena for a few days now, and it's not challenging anymore. Ruko, holding a comic book in his hand, said that without Ling Si, the dungeons they can do are very boring, and Ling Si must be busy right now because after their last operation together as Shadow, they haven't heard from him in a while. Tiana exhaled and said that Ling Si never replies to her messages, and she has probably already sent him a hundred thousand messages. She said that he had disappeared without a trace since the Torchfire dungeon. Tiana looked toward the door. A man with green hair looked in and asked if he had the wrong place. Narlo, apologizing, asked which one of them was Tiana. Everyone looked at him in surprise, and Tiana replied that it was her. Ling Si appeared from behind Narlo and said with a smile that this was Narlo, the new member of Team Shadow. Ruko jumped up from the couch and exclaimed that Lang Si the End had returned. Dark Feather turned around and said with a smile that it had been a long time since they had seen each other. Lang Si greeted him and replied that they really hadn't seen each other for a long time. Tilly's, smirking, said that long time no seeing doesn't apply to her. Tiana shouted for the main character to wait a moment. Pointing to Narlo, she asked if Narlo worked for Squirrel. Lang Si with a smile told her not to worry because he had already cut ties with Wolf's Fang. Narlo grabbed the main character's elbow and said that it was true. Clinging to him, he said with a smile that he now only belongs to Ling Si. Ling Si told him to get off him. Tiana, after being quiet for a while, said that it seems that after he disappeared for a while, his tastes changed. The protagonist told her not to misunderstand him and said that Narlo is a warrior with great potential and malleability that can open up many opportunities for Shadow. Tiana turned away and said that it's okay, it's his choice and they will respect that. Tilly's and Ruko remained silent. Darkfeather said, GG. Ling Si, frowning, said that he plans to build up Shadow step by step. He said that doesn't mean he will increase the number of people on the team, and he wants to make each of them the best in their field. Narlo, noticing the food on the table, got distracted and exclaimed about how many snacks there are. Ruko said he had the newest comics. Tilly's indifferently looking at the dialogue box said she should grab those discounts. Darkfeather was daydreaming. Ling Si, looking at them, thought about his words about the best ones. Tiana asked the protagonist if he needed to inform Stillwaters because it was about Wolf's Fang. Ling Si told her not to worry because he knows what he's doing. He told her with a smile not to underestimate Stillwaters' ability to gather intelligence. He added that he planned to give him a gift. Tiana, frowning and raising an eyebrow, asked about the gift. The protagonist asked about what he had heard about the Tunnel of Gloom. He said that it was the only dungeon at the moment that led to a world that was underground. Tiana opened her eyes in surprise. She asked in surprise that this was the same dungeon that was known as the most difficult dungeon in this version of the game that even the number one guild couldn't pass. Narlo said with a smile that he didn't expect it to get so interesting right after he joined. Ruko said that it looks like there will be another interesting dungeon. Tiana said that from what she heard about the description of the dungeon, it's an entrance to a world underground, and this dungeon might even turn out to be a prelude for a new chapter of the story. Ling Si said with a smirk that there was a high chance that there would be a patch released in the future that related to this dungeon. He said that it will be a very important and big update. He added that it was just his guess and he thought it appealed to all of them too. The members of his team answered in the affirmative with one voice. White clouds floated across the blue sky above the buildings. Squirrel, swearing, slammed his fist on the table. Frowning grimly and gritting his teeth, he said that it was that thief from Nebulous, Ling Si, again. Squirrel said that he couldn't believe that he poached one of the humans. He asked if he was a joke to him. The big guy in armor said he heard that this Ling Si from Nebulous made a fool of him last time. Squirrel said he would make him pay for it. The guy with the sinister face told him about him forgetting his duties. He said he had to nurture this thing to perfect condition and it would be their secret weapon in the next guild battle. Squirrel yelled that he knows how important this is, but he can't let this go. The guy said that their alliance talks with Celestial are on pause for now, and since there's nothing else to do, he'll lead the team to play with this little thief. Turning around, Armored Giant Sawyer, Guildmaster of Wolf's Fang, said he would use this as a way to kill his time. 
Alchemist Emperor Complex. Tilly's asked in surprise about him owning this place. Lang Xi hesitantly replied yes. He thought about how it had expanded again in such a short period of time, and it was now a five-story building. Lang Xi remembered the messages from Van Kaffes, Boss, I'm going to buy the commercial street. I've sent you the expansion proposal. It's about the plan to look for specialized business talent. Give it a read when you're free. Boss, I can't transfer any more money to your account. You need to apply for advanced transactions. The protagonist thought he didn't expect Vankafis to be able to develop the store to this level. Narlo said that it looked pretty good and this scale is not bad at all. Ryuko, surprised at what he said, replied that it was one of Heavenland's most expensive areas. Ling Si said that he brought them all here to get a suite of potions and elixirs. He said that they were very important for the Tunnel of Gloom dungeon they were going to go to. He added that he would introduce them all to Vankafis at the same time. Ling Si thought with a smile as he also wanted to find out how much money he had at the moment. Someone in the crowd inside the building said, You snooze, you lose. He said that this batch of high-grade elixirs was specially made by Alchemy Emperor himself. The main character said that it looks like they have a new product, and excitement is in the air. The man, pointing with his hand, asked to get in line. Tilly said that the potion selection here is very comprehensive, and there are many she hasn't seen before. The man behind them told them not to just stand there if they weren't going to buy anything. A guy with grey hair and a work uniform told them not to just take up space. He asked if they were unaware that loitering was forbidden here. Ruko countered that they were loitering anyway, and they weren't interfering with those in line. He asked who said they are not allowed to stand here. Lang Si told Ruko to leave it. He thought that there seemed to be some problems with Van Kaffes recruitment decisions, and he needed to discuss it with her. The guy with the smirk pointed to the badge on his chest and said he was the leader of this store. He said he was in charge and they should get out of here if they weren't going to buy anything, because he said so. He asked what they were going to do about it. The guy yelled at them that he told them to get out of here. He asked if they were incapable of understanding that. Ling Si, looking at the dialog box, said that he had contacted someone who could solve this problem. He said that she would have to soon. The guy asked with a smirk about him calling for help. He told him to stop acting like a big shot. The guy said this whole street belongs to their alchemist emperor and he knows everyone on the entire management committee. He asked if he could get the alchemist emperor here or something. Laughing, he told him to stop pretending. Behind the guy, the elevator announced its arrival. The guy said with a smirk that he would let them stay here for a few more minutes because he wanted to see who they called. Lang Si said that she was here. The guy turned around and said that was fast and asked who it was. People in the crowd exclaimed in surprise. Another worker asked what the boss was doing here. Someone exclaimed about it being the alchemist emperor herself. Van Kaffes stepped out of the elevator and angrily asked who had treated her boss so rudely. A man in the crowd asked in surprise that it was alchemist emperor. He exclaimed that because of her name, he never would have thought it would turn out to be a little girl. Another man said that she usually stays in the background, appearing only occasionally for short periods of time. He exclaimed that he couldn't believe how lucky he was to see her today. Van Kaffes, frowning, said that she had just revealed a new elixir formula, but the noise interrupted the flow of her thoughts. Van Kaffes sternly told the worker that he was not allowed to be rude to their investor and boss, Ling Si. The guy confusedly asked about him being their boss and investor. Ling Si told Van Kaffes that it came very quickly. Closing one eye, he told the guy that he praises him for taking his responsibility seriously, but he should be more polite when talking to people. He added that, after all, he doesn't know everyone's background. Van Kaffes told him that since his service attitude is problematic, she feels like she needs to extend his probational period. She said she hoped he could correct his mistakes. The guy confusedly apologized. Van Kaffes turned to Ling Si and said she was glad he finally came. She said there was an important thing she'd like to report to him and seek his decision on. The protagonist suggested they talk upstairs. Narlo told the protagonist that he is very magnanimous and cool, and he thinks he got the alchemist emperor to fire that guy. Ling Si replied that he was just doing his job, and as for his attitude, it's up to him to decide if he wants to do something about it. Van Kaffes told him not to worry because she will make the workers be more mindful of this aspect in the future. The elevator announced with a beep that they had arrived on the 8th floor. Van Kaffes said they had arrived and this was the top floor of the building in her new workshop. Once inside the room full of alchemical supplies and workers, she said they were in one of the brewing labs. Ling Si asked how many workers they had at the moment. As he looked around, he thought that it looked like he was right about her, and she was not only a genius in alchemy, but also a business prodigy and was able to raise the alchemist emperor brand name to such heights in such a short time. Van Kaffes replied that she wasn't sure exactly how many employees they had and would need to ask the secretary. Narlo said that this scale is impressive. 
Ruko asked about whether her secretary is a girl or a boy. Bankafis replied that of course it is a girl. She pointed to a girl in a white office suit and glasses with short red hair and said that was Lin, her secretary. Lin turned around and asked who these people were. Ruko, exhaling a sigh of relief, said that it was good news. Bankafis, telling her secretary to remember that, pointed her hand at Ling Si and said it was their boss. After a while, Ling Si asked in surprise that they had 843 employees. Lin raised her index finger up with a smile and said that Alchemist Emperor Company has 363 alchemy experts, 339 workers doing other things like management of the commercial district, sales and delivery. She said they also have 141 workers doing small chores, totaling 843. Bank office, pointing to a door, said this was her office. Demonstrating the view from the huge window, she asked about it being pretty nice. She said she could see their commercial street well from here. Ling Xi said it was quite a sight. Ruko thought it was over and he couldn't match up to Vankafis at all. Vankafis put her hands on her belt and frowned and told the main character that she was just about to send someone to deliver a message to him because he never responds to them. She said that luckily he decided to stop by. Raising her index finger, Vankafis said that a financial corporation is trying to acquire them. Ling Xi asked about them wanting to buy out Alchemist Emperor. She replied that since it was something she had to discuss with him first, she temporarily postponed the matter. The protagonist asked to tell him more about what kind of corporation it was. Vankafis said that recently three men in black showed up at their door and expressed their boss's intentions to purchase them. Ruko asked about the men in black. Vankafis said that this type of brawny men who always wear black suits, also known as men in black. Trying to remember what they called themselves, she assumed they called themselves something like Dumrake Corp. She added that other than that, they didn't say anything else. Ling Si asked about Dumrake Corp. Narlo said it was Daybreak Corp. He explained with a smile that they are the biggest pharmaceutical company in the world known for their research on cancer drugs. He said they control more than half of the world's drug production and their incredible financial power is enough to put some countries to shame. Ling Si said he knows quite a lot. Narlo, scratching the back of his head with a smile, said he just knows a little about the industry. He thought with a serious look that he hadn't expected Daybreak to make their move so soon. He thought with a smirk that it was interesting. Ling Si asked thoughtfully about what exactly it was that she wanted to inform him about. He said to hold off on answering for now because now was not the time. The protagonist thought about the fact that in his past life, after they forcefully broke into Heavenland, they had used their terrifying financial power to take over many in-game businesses and functions. He thought that they then occupied about a third of the game's entire exchange and had complicated relationships with the various major guilds due to mutual self-interests. Ling Si thought that he didn't expect them to make their move into the game so soon, however, there were already all sorts of unpredictable changes happening. Vankafis asked him why he had dropped by. Ling Si asked about the fact that they're pretty rich right now. Vankafis, with her head back thoughtfully, said that if they don't look at things from the point of view of vulgar players, but from the point of view of business development, their capital flow is very favorable. She said that they can just define their current status with one word like poor or rich, and she can only say that they have a healthy capital chain and their cash flow is also quite good. Ling Si asked what that means in terms of vulgar players. Ruko surprisingly said that he didn't understand a word of what she said. Vankafis, raising her hands, replied that they were incredibly rich. Ling Si replied with a smirk that that was fine with him. Ruko said that he understood now and that means they are very rich. The main character said that he came here to make sure they have a large amount of money ready. He said that they will start to expand soon. Ling Si asked if she remembered what he said about establishing a business empire. He said that his goal is to become not only the best in potions business but also in the whole industry. Vankafis with sparkling eyes happily exclaimed that he just had to say the word. She asked what was next. Ling Si, blushing, said that he had spent all his money and he urgently needed money and some potions. He asked her to give him the money first. Tillies and the rest of the team thought about whether they were now looking at Layabout who was asking his rich mom for pocket money. Vankafis handed him a gold card and told him it was a new gold card with a higher credit limit. Ling Si happily raised the gold card above his head and said that with this they should be ready for the near future. Tillies asked about if they were going to go to the dungeon and why he needed so much money. The protagonist replied that that's what they needed them for. He said that in order to have a better time clearing it and get some levels at the same time, there was something they needed to acquire. Vankafis folded her arms across her chest with a satisfied smile. Ling Si said with a smile that there was a secret store that had a magic tool that would allow them to quickly go through the dungeon. The Tunnel of Gloom Dungeon. Ling Si and his team walked out of the red portal. Looking at the skeletons around, Ruko said that as expected of the most difficult dungeon so far, the appearance alone separated it from the rest. He asked Ling Si what their strategy was. The protagonist told him to be quiet. 
he told him to remember the first rule, you can't talk loudly here. Narlo asked if that mage girl was talking about how even the number one guild couldn't pass this dungeon. He said that they are punching above their weight here. He said that he had heard that this dungeon had three floors, each more deadly than the last, and guild number one was on the second floor. Narlo asked Ling Si if he was confident that they could handle it. With a frightened shriek, he said that those had worms in them. Ruko told him with a smirk that he didn't seem to know Ling Si yet, and he doesn't get into battles he can't win. Tilly said that since he brought them here, it meant they could definitely handle it. Narlo thought about the fact that his teammates clearly believe in him, and he is looking forward to seeing what he can do. He thought about the fact that on top of that, there was also the business empire he was trying to build. Narlo thought about maybe he could introduce him to his old man in the future. Ling Si said that it was indeed a very difficult dungeon, and the reason was simple, it was the first dungeon of the underworld. He said that the player still doesn't know how to deal with the monster attacks here, and on top of that, the level of the dungeon is too high. Ling Si said with a grim smirk that this stuff costs more than one gold per bottle, and his heart is bleeding. Standing on the cliff towering over the monsters, he said, they should give these monsters a proper greeting. The main character with a sinister smile opened the yellow potion bottle and said that this time he would go all out in a blitz. Narlo asked in surprise that he was going to lure enemies in such a difficult dungeon by himself. He added that there are poisonous fumes below. Ling Si, raising his index finger, told him to be quiet because these underground monsters have very sharp senses and should be quiet. Narlo apologized. The main character said that he knew what he was doing. He said to prepare their superior holy morning dew and explain that after they consume it, the holy attribute will be added to their attacks and it will allow them to deal true damage to those annoying things. He added that on top of that, they will also get a holy halo effect that will nullify their corroding darkness. Narlo mentioned about the fact that the fact that it is so expensive is not surprising. Lang Si jumped down and told them to wait for him to lure them out. Narlo exclaimed in surprise that he had gone just like that. He asked if they needed to discuss strategy. Tilly's told him with a slight smile that there was no need to overreact, and he should just follow their pace. Ruko, looking at him with a smile with one eye, said that this was another familiar tactic of Ling Si, and he already understood it much better. A mid-grade poison resist potion appeared in the main character's hand, and he disabled the passive skill blessing of the giant king. The dialogue box says, you have deactivated the passive skill blessing of the giant king. You may reactivate the skill in 30 minutes. Ling Si fell to the ground among the monsters. He was enveloped by purple energy and used Conqueror's concealment. A carriage with two horses was traveling down the road. Blue Cloud, sitting in the carriage, asked, raising an eyebrow at what he said about Guildmaster Sawyer taking a team with him and going to the Tunnel of Gloom dungeon. Fallen Whale replied that was correct, and they had also received news that Ling Si from Nebulus had just entered Tunnel of Gloom with his team. He said that it looked like Wolf's Fang was making their move. Blue Cloud, laughing, said that Ling Si has become even more prominent since they last saw him. He said that he had heard about Ling Si thoroughly humiliating Squirrel some time ago. Continuing to laugh, Celestial's Guildmaster said that with his abilities, he wouldn't be able to avoid attracting the attention of bosses of various walks of life. Fallen Whale, raising an eyebrow, said that since they had allied with Wolf's Fang, they had only worked together with them on some dungeon runs and had some superficial exchanges. He said that no matter how they looked at it, it was still an official alliance, and if there was a conflict between them, they would have to step in. Blue Cloud said with a smirk that it was a matter of time and he could guarantee that Sawyer was going after Ling Si. He added with a chuckle that there is bound to be a fierce conflict there. Fallen Whale asked what he wanted to say. Blue Cloud replied that since they decided to become allies, they should act like allies. Rubbing his neck, he ordered to be ready to mobilize teams at any time, and said that if war broke out, Celestial would not be behind. He said with a smirk that he was afraid it would be an all-out battle. Ruko, looking down from the cliff, asked where Ling Si. Dark Feather with his eye burning yellow pointed his finger and said he was there. Narlo said that he has very good eyesight and the fact that he can see Ling Si in such conditions is unbelievable. Ling Si, shrouded in a purple aura, was jumping between the monsters. He thought that his level was higher than the monsters on the first floor, so his presence was like thin air to them. As he continued advancing between the rocks, the protagonist thought that his mission was to get the aggro of all the monsters on this floor, and his goal is the boss that lies in the depths of this area. Lang Si used mid-grade poison resist potion. Running inside the dark tunnel of the cave, he thought that he had been running for about 15 minutes, and he should be close by now. Advancing through the narrow winding tunnel, the protagonist thought that the twists and turns of these underground tunnels were like a complex maze, and if he hadn't joined a random team in his past life and learned the map, he would surely lose a lot of time getting into dead ends. As he approached the exit of the tunnel, he thought to himself, if he remembered correctly, this is it. In front of Ling Si appeared a huge purple centipede. Above the bloodthirsty centipede's head, it said that it had level 70. Ling Si thought that it was 10 levels higher than him. 
The dialog box informed that since the protagonist's level was lower than the enemies within range, its stealth status would be easily seen through. Ling Si thought that he was already mentally prepared for this. He opened a bottle of superior holy morning dew. A dialog box announced that his presence had been detected. The monster used poison rush, exhaling a stream of poisonous gas on the protagonist, which Ling Si was immune to. Ling Si said he knew all of its moves and attack patterns, and his very first move is to spit poison. Using backstab, the protagonist stabbed the monster in the back. Centipede swung his tail and hit the protagonist. Lang Si used evil spirits and visibility, and a purple evil spirit appeared in front of the monster. Surrounded by electricity, the protagonist appeared in front of the monster and said that being so deep underground, he had probably never seen a lightning strike. On his forehead was a mage sigil, and he said with a smirk that holy element had been added to it, and it's gonna taste real good. Ling Si used Elemental Manifestation Thunder Flash, striking the monster's head with lightning. He used Shadow Ambush and said with a wicked smile that he didn't care if he was 10 levels higher because he could cut it down all the same. Tilly's, Ruko, and Narlo were sitting on the ground playing Don Dijou. Narlo, after throwing Ace Pair, said he had one card left. Tilly's, swearing, told Ruko to bomb if he can because this is their last chance and the landlord will win. Ruko told her not to worry and to watch his move. Dark Feather asked if this guy was lost. He said he saw with his eagle vision that there are tons of tunnels and it wouldn't be weird if he got lost. Ruko threw down two pair. Narlo offered to go down and take a look because he felt like letting Ling Si go down there alone to lure monsters was overkill. Turning to the game interface, he said hold. Ruko told him to have faith in Ling Si and not to interfere with his rhythm. He said about the eight pair and about not being able to block it anymore. He asked Tilly's what her strongest card was. Tilly's replied, an ace. Narlo irritatedly asked how they could discuss it so openly and what was the point of the game then. Tilly said with a smirk that she had a bomb. Narlo opened his mouth in surprise. Ling Si stood beside the motionless boss. After drinking the potion, he turned to the monster. The monster swished its tail, and the protagonist bounced, saying that it had finally woken up. Smirking, he said that a little more and he would have overdone it and killed it with that blow, and that wouldn't have been good at all. Landing in front of the centipede whose eyes were glowing red, Ling Si said that he was not allowed to die here. The monster opened its mouth, bleeding. The protagonist, jumping into the tunnel, told him to follow him and he would take him to the others to share the experience with them. One of the monsters was sitting in the mist among the rocks. When he heard a noise, he turned around sharply. The monsters saw the centipede who was chasing after the fleeing Ling Si. The protagonist, laughing, shouted for them all to follow him. He said that they were going to the outskirts and he wouldn't leave any of them behind. Narlo asked in surprise if it was an earthquake. Ruko said it was coming. Weapons appeared in their hands, and Tilly said that a little more and she would have fallen asleep. Ruko said with a smirk, it was the same familiar formula. Lang Si, who was being chased by a huge crowd of monsters, shouted to prepare the potions. Tilly's, Ruko, Narlo and Dark Feather ran forward, jumping down from the cliff. Lang Si, jumping towards the centipede, shouted that they would take them all out in one fell swoop. Dark Feather, Tilly's, Narlo and Ruko fought the monsters, and the protagonist told them not to let any of them slip away. A dialogue box announced victory, and Narlo told Ling Si that this first floor was unremarkable. He asked why this boss had so little health. Tunnel of Gloom, Floor 2. They came out of the portal into a dungeon full of lava, and Ling Si said he got too carried away and almost killed him. Ruko said that's why he was telling him that he didn't understand him. He said that in the dungeon they went through together earlier, Ling Si also went to attract the aggro of all the monsters by himself and then killed them all along the way. Ruko said that he wanted to help them raise levels, but they ended up not gaining any levels because they were all too far away and Ling Si got all the experience. Laughing, he said that they had no choice but to start over and this was the first time they had to redo a challenge. Ignoring Ruko, Narlo asked the protagonist if he was always so chatty. Ling Si replied that this was already the toned down version. Standing in front of the lava lake, he said that they had arrived, and this was the crux of the second floor. There were stone monsters roaming in the lava. Tilly said that judging by the lava constructs in a field like this, it looks like the second floor is a test of the player's positioning skills and maneuverability. She said that from what she heard, the number one guild couldn't make it past the second floor, and it looked like that was where they fell. Dark Feather said, GG. Ruko, crouching behind the ground and wiping sweat from his forehead, said that this sea of lava is terrifyingly immense, and on those platforms they have to be careful not to slip and fall, and yet each platform can only hold one person, and they have to fight monsters as well. Ling Si said that he was sure that the lack of technique was not the reason why the number one guild failed, and they failed because they couldn't handle the underground monsters. Narlo, surrounded by blue electricity, without listening to the protagonist until the end, jumped forward and hit the monster with a swing of his sword. Agreeing, he said that if it wasn't for the superior holy elemental damage from the superior holy morning dew, 
they would have barely dealt any damage to them. The protagonist concluded that the fact that they were able to get through the first floor without the holy element was already very impressive. Dark Feather fired his pistol, the shot blew a hole in the monster behind Narlo, and he said in agreement that things would have been different for them if they had the extra damage of using superior Holy Morning Dew. The main character said with a chuckle that unfortunately they still didn't know where to buy Holy Morning Dew. He said that it would take them about 20 minutes to cross this sea of lava. He asked about the fact that they now understand why he had to buy so much Holy Morning Dew. This floor is no cakewalk. The lack of footholds, as well as the lava constructs that would randomly spawn, were the biggest headaches for the players in Ling Si's previous life. With the superior Holy Morning Dew in hand, Ling Si and his team were able to inflict lethal damage to the lava constructs. As Ruko couldn't afford to turn big, and Tilly's was disadvantaged due to her elemental type, Narlo had to pull his weight using his Thunder AoE skills and played a crucial role in keeping the team alive. In addition, with Ling Si leading the charge on an inverted Y formation, Tilly's and Ruko were well protected. Shadow's teamwork grew increasingly stronger. In the end, Ling Si and his team spent 18 minutes to clear the second floor. The man in the cave near the river asked about the fact that they still hadn't come out. Another man answered him that it was true, and their companions who were waiting in ambush near the other exits hadn't seen them come out either. In front of them was a white portal to the Tunnel of Gloom dungeon, and the guy in armor said that they had been inside for a long time. Sawyer folded his arms across his chest and said that it looked like they were really skilled. He asked if they had really made it past the first floor. The other guy in armor told him that they had received an update. Waving his hands, he said that they had received news that Nebulous and Celestial had activated their members and were on their way here. Sawyer replied that he wasn't surprised that Nebulous had decided to come here looking for him after hearing the news. He said with a grim smirk that he hadn't expected Blue Cloud to be so passionate about this alliance of theirs. Sawyer began to laugh, exuding red energy. The red energy surrounded him, and he laughed loudly. With a smirk, he said that it was interesting. Sawyer clenched his fist and a weapon appeared on it. He said that a clash was now inevitable. He ordered the men in armor to get ready, and they placed a hand on his chest. Bearing his large fangs, Sawyer said with a wide grin that he didn't care how many people came here, because it wouldn't make him change his intentions to turn this thief from nebulous to a bloody paste. Ruko looked around the cave walls covered in blue crystals and said that if he didn't know they were in a dungeon, he would have thought they were standing under a starry night sky. Lings he asked with a smile that it was beautiful. He said that these underground glowing ores attached to such a dark roof looked like sparkling stars. Tunnel of Gloom, Floor 3. Ling Si's team sailed down the underground river in three boats. The main character said that they also gave the third floor of this dungeon the name Pseudo Night Sea. Exhaling, Ruko said that although it's beautiful, why do they have to sail boats in this floor? Ling Si said that the main difficulty of this level is that they would all have to attack and defend at the same time while being on boats, and it's not easy at all. Ruko, sitting tiredly on the floor of the boat, said that he might get seasick. Narlo asked why he was alone. He said he wanted to ride with his master too. Tilly said that this last floor is quite interesting. She said that they have been sailing these boats for some time. She asked where the boss was. Ling Si replied that he is past this opening. Looking at the dialogue box, he said that they may have already arrived. Noticing a red light in the water, Ruko asked what it was. Ling Si told them to be careful and hold on tight. A huge monster with tentacles emerged from the underwater, raising waves and rocking the boats. Gigantic fiend of the pseudo sea, Taviathan's eyes glowed red. Ruko said that it was huge and they would have to defeat it. Ling Si smiled slightly. He leaped from the boat towards the monster. Noticing Dark Feather leaping forward with him, Ling Si praised him for his impressive reaction speed. Firing his pistol, Dark Feather said that for him, this kind of reaction speed is just the foundation for a skilled ranged player. The protagonist said that attacks on his body will only do minor damage, and on top of that he will begin to regenerate once in the water. He said his weakness is the eyes on his back, but he will use the crystals in the dungeon to spawn all sorts of mobs to protect himself. Black energy enveloped the blue crystals. Ling Si said that it was time to act. He ordered the small fry to be dealt with first. They all used superior holy morning dew, and Tilly said that it looked like they could clear this wave smoothly. The mutant soldiers of the pseudo sea appeared in front of them, looking like blobs of dark purple energy surrounded by a red aura. One of the monsters swung its arm, ending up behind Dark Feather's back. He turned around and started firing his two pistols. After killing the monster, he said, GG. Tilly's, surrounded by flames, was fighting several monsters, and Ruko was defending himself with a shield. Clutching the staff tightly in her hand, Tilly's used Phoenix Dance, shooting flames in the shape of a bird. She reminded Ling Si of what she owed him. She shouted for him to hurry up and make up his mind on what he wanted. Ling Si, frowning, was silent for a while. Smiling, he asked about the fact that although she is the one who owes him a favor, why does it feel as if it's the other way around? 
Tilly's, slightly embarrassed, replied that she didn't like being indebted to others. Ruko used spinning strike, raising the vortex above him with his huge hand. Laughing, he said that thanks to the superior holy element from superior holy morning dew, their attacks were deadly to these monsters, and that was very satisfying. Narlo used thunderous calling, destroying the monsters around him with yellow lightning. Ruko said with a smirk that he didn't even need to transform into his giant form to fight them. Narlo thought in surprise that this chatterbox could do that. Ling Si shouted for everyone to beware of the monster's tentacles. The monster started waving its tentacles, hitting the water with them and raising huge waves. Narlo, trying to steady himself on the boat, said that his thunder attack seemed to make him angry. The monster raised its tentacle over Narlo. Ling Si said that this sea monster is weak against thunder, not fire. Narlo looked at the monster's tentacle with disgust. With a wave of its tentacle, the monster struck the water with force. Surrounded by pink tentacles, the protagonist said with a smirk that it was right. He told the monster to help him get rid of the spectral soldiers he had summoned, and he would treat him to some tasty thunder attacks in return. Narlo exclaimed that this is brilliant, and he feels like he knows what he is going to do next. Ling Si said to help him deal with those mobs first. He ordered to destroy the crystals that are used to summon them to cut off their energy. Tilly's, Ruko, and Darkfeather replied that they understood. The purple, red, and yellow energies destroyed the blue crystals, and they said that they seemed to have destroyed all the crystals nearby. Ling Si said that now it was time to deal with this big guy. Ruko, exhaling heavily, said that they cleared six waves of mobs, and that was with the help of Superior Holy Morning Dew. He said that he couldn't imagine how hopeless the other teams who didn't know about this elemental effect would feel. Ling Si turned around and said with a smirk that knowledge was money, and once they passed this dungeon, they would be able to sell walkthroughs for it. Ling Si told his team members standing on the boats behind him that he needed their help in attracting the aggro tentacle monster. He told Narlo that he then needed him to work with him to hit it with their strongest thunder elemental attacks. The protagonist said he wanted to pump electricity into his entire body at once and make each of his eyes burst. He said he needed them to work together to do this. They all rushed to attack the huge monster. Ling Si thought that he had always wanted to try and find out if his glorious one skills could work in tandem with his spell thief skills. He thought that if he was right, it would become a great weapon in his arsenal. Frowning, he shouted to Narlo to get ready. Narlo obeyed while Tilly's and Ruko struck at the monster. Ling Si used a single-use grappling hook while climbing up above the monster. He said with a wicked smile that he needed to climb higher so that he could send it straight to hell from there. There was an explosion above the monster's head, and something hit him in the head. Rocks rained down on him from above. Noticing the bright light, the monster turned around. Lang Si used Greatsword Heavensward, and the monster saw above him the protagonist and a huge purple spirit with a huge sword. Using Elemental Manifestation Thunderflash, the protagonist gritted his teeth and decided to infuse elemental power into Heavensward, exactly like he did with his daggers. The huge sword was shrouded in purple electricity. Narlo, standing in front of the monster, used Thunder Serpent. The protagonist's huge sword and Narlo's yellow lightning struck the monster from both sides. Somewhere at the same time, Taba Zengo chopped the monster in half. He questioned about why they needed to be on this team in the first place. Waving his sword, he said that he wanted to challenge Tunnel of Gloom again, and he had been thinking all along that there must be some way to pass this underground dungeon. Taba Zengo offered to go with him to the library to see if there was any information about this underground dungeon. The guy with blue hair exclaimed about how incredible he was and did almost all the damage needed on his own. He said that was to be expected from their guild's main DPS. Temptress said she wanted to go on a date. Putting a finger to her lips, she said it wasn't her style to read. She suggested going to the bars to see if they could find out anything from NPCs and get some drinks at the same time. Taba Zengo suggested not doing that because the last time he went to a bar with her, the guys started a fight over her. He asked how many bars have already blacklisted her. He added that he ended up getting blacklisted too for no particular reason. Laughing, Temptress asked about isn't that interesting. Taba Zengo noticed something and looked away in surprise. Temptress asked what was wrong and why he was spacing out. Taba Zengo said with a grim face that someone had managed to pass Tunnel of Gloom before them, the number one guild. Temptress opened her mouth in surprise. The dialogue boxes said, new record. First server wide clear of Tunnel of Gloom on the Insanity difficulty. Congratulations on setting a new record for Tunnel of Gloom on the Insanity difficulty. Ruko shouted happily to Ling Si that they had succeeded and they were the first to clear it. The dialog box says, Congratulations on being the first to clear Tunnel of Gloom on the Insanity difficulty. The protagonist grinned, thinking that a new challenge was coming up. The dialog box says, Congratulations to the Nebulous Guild for being the first to clear Tunnel of Gloom on the Insanity difficulty. The people in the crowd looked at the dialog boxes in surprise. The path to the underground is now open. The huge monument began to glow with a blindingly bright light. 
a massive patch, the world beneath, will be released in three days. The people in the crowd looked at the glowing monument. A whole new map awaits you, adventurer. There will be new equipment for you to discover. Even more missions and dungeons. Look forward to it. Tilly's asked in surprise that they had actually triggered a whole new patch. Narlo said that he didn't just exhaust himself killing those mobs. Ruko said it looks like it's gonna be awesome. Leng Si, upon landing, said that the impact of this dungeon is probably much bigger than they imagine. He said that they belong to the above-ground world. Closing his eyes, the main character said with a smile that the mechanics of the above-ground world would be even more exciting and interesting. Narlo, rubbing his chin thoughtfully, asked why he felt as if he knew it was coming. Tilly said that Leng Si is always like this and he will get used to it. Ruko said that Leng Si knows everything and he is a professional among professionals. The protagonist, frowning nervously, said that just like he said, many books in the library have clues about things like this. He said that this was a game after all, and it had rules and patterns. Leng Si mentally told him to stop asking because if he asked anything else, he would just say he was transmigrated. He told them to go because they had been here long enough and it was time to leave the dungeon. Ruko asked who would drive the boat to get to the exit. He asked Dark Feather. Dark Feather said no. Tilly's said not to ask her. Leng Si with a smirk told Narlo to do it. He asked why him specifically. The protagonist replied that it was because he was new. Leng Si and his team saw the exit of the cave. Coming out of it, Narlo said that they finally made it out. Leng Si offered to return to the guild. Noticing the dialogue box, he turned around. Tilly's said that a message had been sent to him. Leng Si clicked the accept button. Many dialogue boxes appeared in front of him with messages from Tiana and Stillwaters. The protagonist exclaimed about it being a lot of messages. He asked about whether they had been sent while they were in the dungeon. Tilly's asked who sent them. Ryuko, also looking at the dialogue boxes, replied that it was Tiana and the other people in the guild. Noticing the messages from Coco Lai, he asked in surprise what was going on. Ling Si asked what was going on. He said that he even got a message from Guildmaster Stillwaters. Tilly's asked what they wanted to tell them. Leng Si opened his mouth in surprise. The dialogue boxes said, Get away from the dungeon now. Hurry and get away. You've been surrounded by Wolf's Fang's guildmaster. It's dangerous. Hurry and retreat at once. Reinforcements from the guild are on the way. Sawyer of Wolf's Fang and his team are lying in ambush. You must leave at once. Reply when you see this. Sawyer, standing on the rock, said that he had waited a long time. Leng Si and his team looked up in surprise. Sawyer asked about the fact that they must be Shadow. He jumped down with force, leaving a crater in the ground from the fall. Leng Si ordered them to spread out. Swinging a huge fist, Sawyer with an evil grin told them not to even dream of escaping. His punch raised a huge cloud of dust. A dialogue box announced that Shadow was being attacked. Blood spurted from Ruko's mouth, and he said that if he wanted to hurt his teammates, he had to deal with that tank first. Sawyer, shrouded in a red aura, asked with a smirk that he could gigantify. He blocked Ruko's huge arm with his hand, and Ruko was surprised to think that his attack did nothing to him. Sawyer's eyes glowed red, and he said interestingly. Sending Ruko into the stone wall with his punch, he said that he was still too small compared to him. Leng Si gritted his teeth, and Tilly's called out to Ruko. Sawyer asked the main character about being the thief named Leng Si. He said that they were next and this place would be their grave. Leng Si, looking at the silhouettes around them, thought about the fact that they were surrounded. The smile from Sawyer's face disappeared, and he glanced forward. The giant Ruko, shrouded in purple electricity, asked who he called small. He walked through a dissipating cloud of dust, and Tilly's asked if he was okay. Ruko replied that he was fine, and he didn't have a scratch on him. The protagonist said that he never thought that the mighty armored giant, Sawyer, the guildmaster of Wolf's Fang, would personally lead his team to hunt down this humble little team, Shadow. He said they didn't deserve that kind of attention. Sawyer disagreed. Smiling broadly, he said that according to what he had found out, not even mentioning the fact that they were able to be the first to pass the Tunnel of Gloom Dungeon. Shadow and the thief Ling Si in particular were completely worthy of whatever he was about to do. Ling Si, frowning, thought that Sawyer had obtained his title of Armored Giant for a reason. Thinking back to his ground strike, he thought that with that terrifying combination of strength and defense, Knowing him only through rumors from his past life, he never would have thought that his speed would also turn out to be tremendous. Leng Si tensely thought that if this past attack was a direct hit, he would probably have lost two-thirds of his health. Narlo said that they brought their armored squad with them. He said that was very thoughtful of him. The guy in armor, pointing his finger at Narlo, called him a traitor. Sawyer, smiling evilly, noticed Narlo and said he would get rid of that dirty traitor first. He said that Squirrel would probably be happy to hear about it. Shadow team members stood around Narlo, and Ling Si told Sawyer not to get his hopes up. He said that Narlo is now a member of Team Shadow, and they won't let him touch him with a finger. Narlo was overjoyed. Darkfeather said that while he has the advantage of distance, he can't use it well in this kind of terrain. 
he added that he had no choice anyway. Guy ordered the armored squad to attack, and they jumped off the cliff. Sawyer used upheaval, and a huge vortex appeared above his head. Narlo said that it looked like Guildmaster Sawyer really had it against him. Turning around, he said with a smile that he had never had a chance to cross blades with him, and he felt that now was his chance to find out what Sawyer was capable of. Sawyer, swinging his fist, called him an impudent fool. Narlo, surrounded by yellow electricity, leaped towards him. Ling Si shouted about how he should not take this attack head on. He said that once he was in the vicinity, his physical defense would immediately be lowered by 50%. The protagonist shouted at him to be careful because he could kill him with one blow. Narlo exclaimed in surprise that that sounded nasty. Ruko's huge hand appeared behind him. Grabbing Narlo with his hand, Ruko saved him from the attack. Standing in front of Sawyer, he swung his huge fist. Their fists collided. Sawyer said with a smirk that he was about to face his upheaval head on, and he's not as feeble as he looks. Ling Si told Narlo not to just stand there and hurry out of this cramped space. He said Sawyer's wide-reaching attacks will put them at a great disadvantage. Narlo rejoiced that their little buddy could go big to bail him out. He added that he was also touched that Ling Si was worried about him. Ruko, surrounded by yellow electricity, used shockwave. Sawyer, laughing, asked what kind of entry-level skill it was and if he thought he could even scratch him with it. The armor guy yelled out that they had managed to escape. Turning around, Sawyer asked about the fact that he had escaped. He saw that there was no one in front of him. Grinning, he said he liked the feeling of chasing after prey. Sawyer said there was nothing better than slowly choking the life out of them. He ordered them to catch up because they wouldn't be able to escape. As they ran away, Tilly said that these men had prepared themselves both in terms of skills and equipment. She said that in addition to their tremendous defense strength, they have a good strategy behind their composition, and it looks like they have been training for this for a long time. Tilly said that their opponents came prepared and won't stop until they stomp them completely. Ling Si suggested to avoid getting picked off, to get to a safe zone and teleport from there. He said they would split up once they got out of the caves and return to Nebulus to figure out what to do next. The others agreed. As they jumped off the cliff, they heard a voice saying something about how he didn't expect them to actually be able to elude him. The squirrel on the ship said that he was glad that he still had another card to play. He told Ling Si that they had been waiting for him for a long time. Pointing his finger at him, Squirrel said with a smirk that it was for a reason and now they will see if they can escape this time. Narlo said that he was a nasty fellow. Ling Si, frowning, said that it looked like they wouldn't be able to avoid a direct confrontation. Sawyer, standing on the rock, laughed and said that he didn't expect Sawyer to be right. He said they did manage to slip away. Smiling broadly, he said about them being like fish in a barrel. Sawyer asked if that was the right phrase. Tilly's asked the protagonist what now. She said the two guildmasters of Wolf's Fang are here with their guild members and it looks bad. Darkfeather said that they could handle it if there were two of them, but not with their numerical advantage. Ling Si started laughing. Darkfeather looked at him in surprise. The protagonist broke out into loud laughter. Narlo surprisingly said that he could laugh in a situation like this. With a confident smirk, Ling Si asked why he shouldn't laugh. He said that it was one thing when the head of one of the five major guilds personally led his teams to attack them, but now they had even mobilized their vice guildmaster and the rest of the guild. Waving his hands, the protagonist said that it was all for them, Shadow. He said it would be a fight to be remembered. Squirrel, gritting his teeth furiously, said that this brainless fool was still talking big in the face of death. He said that this time he would make him kneel, begging for mercy. Sawyer, reflecting on the courage and bravado of this thief, thought that they could no longer let him do as he wished. Tilly smirked, and Darkfeather said that that'll be GG for them. A dagger appeared in Ling Si's hand, and Narlo said that he had said well, and he had done the right thing when he decided to follow him. Ruko, laughing, said that they shadow would soon become legends. Sawyer, raising his fist in the air, announced the beginning of this cradle of slaughter. A voice called out Wolf's Fang, shouting that they were a disgrace. Everyone present turned around upon hearing this voice. Coco Lai, surrounded by people from their guild, asked about them really pulling all stops just for the sake of a five-man team from Nebulus. Gira asked about them daring to touch her people from Nebulus. She yelled that she would cut out their entire guild. Tiana said she was glad they made it in time. She said that it took more resources than she expected. Ruko exclaimed happily that it was Tiana, Dira, and Vice Guildmaster. Leng Si said with a smirk that he didn't expect him to come as well. The man told Leng Si that he hoped they weren't too much too late. Stillwaters stepped forward. Sawyer, grinning, told Stillwaters that he didn't expect this thief to be so important to him. He said that he couldn't have imagined that he would personally come for this. He added that it was a rare sight. Stillwaters replied that he was a shameless guildmaster who tried to lay a finger on his team. Sawyer said with a wide smile that his foul mouth didn't seem to have changed at all. Ling Si said he didn't expect him to show up. Stillwaters replied that if it's about him, he can't ignore it. Dira told Ruko about how they haven't seen each other in a while. 
Ruko thanked her for coming to their aid. A little embarrassed, she replied that she actually came here to protect Tiana. Dira said that the moment she found out that they were ambushed, she immediately asked the guild head about sending guild members to help them. She said that in order to open that portal, the guild had spent a lot of resources for their sake. Ruko exclaimed that Tiana was very helpful. Tiana gave a thumbs up with a smile. Dira said that they were informed about it by Wasabi. Ling Si said that they hadn't seen him in a while, but it turns out that he had been working hard to gather information. He added that this one came in just in time. Ruko grinned and said that it was for leading them into a trap last time. Squirrel said that they were right on time, and now that they were all here, he could avenge the last guild war. He ordered the attack, and the warriors rushed in. Tilly said they would go as well. Dira, swinging her sword, ordered them to defend Tiana and the portal because they can't let them cut off their reinforcements. Sawyer, jumping off the cliff, shouted that in that case they couldn't afford to fall behind either. Lowering his visor, he said that he would just get rid of that cleric and then smash that little thief. A bird-shaped yellow energy rushed forward, and Coco Lai shouted to Stillwaters to step back. A yellow magic arrow struck Sawyer. Coco Lai, holding a bow in her hand, said something about how he couldn't afford to confront someone with that kind of physique. She told Sawyer not to think he could get close to Stillwaters so easily. Sawyer said with a smirk that such an attack is barely capable of leaving a mark. Coco Lai said that, just like the rumors say, he has a terrifying level of defense. Ling Si told Ruko about how he should focus on defending Stillwaters. Ruko obeyed. Noticing the squirrel approaching from behind, the protagonist said that it looked like an old enemy was targeting him. Sawyer used Metal Smash, hitting with a fist shrouded in red energy. Ruko used Lion King Shield, and a golden shield appeared in front of him, blocking the enemy's strike. Sawyer said that he was able to withstand his punch, and he had underestimated him. As he continued to strike, he thought about that light. Stillwaters was standing behind Ruko, using Holy Light reinforcement. Yellow energy enveloped Ruko, and Sawyer realized it was Stillwaters. Stillwaters said Ling Si has got a keen eye. He said with a smile that he was able to spot such hidden potential in Ruko. He said that against Sawyer, he is still fighting, and he will help him. Stillwaters told Ruko that they could let Wolf's Fang look down on them. A yellow light enveloped Ruko. A dialogue box read, special boost, all stats increased by 54% lasts for 30 seconds. Sawyer, laughing, said that no matter how big his shield was, he wouldn't be able to withstand his attack. He said he thought this thief was the only one in Nebulous he should keep an eye out for, but he didn't expect them to have a guy who could get big. Steam came out of his armor and Sawyer said the warm-up was over and now he was going to play with him for a bit. Shrouded in red energy, he lunged into the attack, swinging his fist. His punch raised a huge cloud of dust, and Coco Lai, shooting yellow magic arrows, told Stillwaters not to leave her sight. Stillwaters asked if she was underestimating him too much. He added that he was one of the best clerics in Heavenland after all. Coco Lai, embarrassed, told him not to try to act tough now because she knows he's been weak since they were kids. Stillwaters, smiling awkwardly, said it was back then. Coco Lai shouted to him about how she didn't want to see him hurt himself again so he should stay in her sight. Stillwaters said with an awkward smile that he understood and asked him not to get mad. One of the guys in the crowd said it was just a game and the two started flirting. Blazing with anger, the crowd of guys yelled about killing them all. Agro activated group skill, grievances of the perilous wolves. Coco Lai turned around and said they were coming up. Stillwaters asked to be allowed to help. He used splintered reinforcements and Coco Lai was enveloped in yellow energy. Splintered reinforcements creates a magic circle. Within the circle, the ally with the highest attack power will be cloned. Each splintered clone will inherit the attack stat from the source. The clones cannot use any skills and can only perform normal attacks. Duration, 9 seconds. A huge yellow magic circle appeared under Stillwaters and Coco Lai's feet, and several of her clones appeared next to Coco Lai. Stillwaters said that quantity was not a problem now. Coco Lai said that wasn't bad and she could roll with that. She smirked and drew the bowstring and said that they shouldn't look down on her normal attack and attack speed. She used her normal attacks, rapid fire. A multitude of yellow magic arrows struck the crowd of opponents. There was a scream. Squirrel used life-severing cut and plunged a dagger into Ling Si's neck. The protagonist used evil spirits and visibility, and Ling Si turned into an evil purple spirit. Squirrel, frowning, said that it was that trick again, and he wouldn't fall for it this time. Using negativity cleanse, he said his top time had gotten better since the last time they saw each other. A dialogue box reported that he had cancelled the fear effect. Ling Si, hitting with purple energy, asked if that was the case. Squirrel, using sharp thrust, told him not to think that he could easily defeat him with his speed. Ling Si, being airborne, agreed and said that he was not only a combat-focused thief now. Above his head was a blue magic circle. The protagonist said with a smirk that he had found helpers. Tilly's and the knight in golden armor hit Squirrel, and he dodged with a top time. Squirrel asked about the sneak attack. 
Ling Si said that it was indeed improved. He told Tilly's and Knight that he would leave it to the two of them. He told them to entertain him instead and he will help Ruko. The Knight replied that he heeded and obeyed. Tilly's told Squirrel with a smirk that she still remembered him, and the Vice Guildmaster would be a good target for practice. Squirrel asked about some unfamiliars and teammates. He asked Ling Si if he had the courage to settle it with a one-on-one -on -one duel. Ling Si thought that this squirrel could only talk, and even after they crossed blades, he doubted that he had become much stronger. He thought that the duo of Tilly's and the knight should be enough to handle him. He said that this so-called vice guildmaster was just another loser who had lost to him, and he had no reason to waste his time on him. Squirrel angrily demanded for him to come back. Ling Si, leaving, said that he wasn't interested in a sore loser like him, and they would first see if he could handle them first. Looking at the warriors and mages fighting, he thought that there was no point in defeating such an opponent, and the lifelong effect would only be if he was thoroughly humiliated. The protagonist thought that dealing with him was the most important thing to change the course of this battle. Remembering the face of Wolf's Fang's guild leader, he thought that the most important thing was Sawyer. He looked to the side in surprise. A voice shouted that a new portal had been discovered, and it was the Celestial Guild. The carriages stopped near the battlefield, and the guy told the guild leader that these must be the correct coordinates of the battlefield. Blue Cloud, getting out of the carriage, said with a wide smile that it looked like they had already started. Ling Si, clucking his tongue, said that things were starting to get complicated. Blue Cloud shouted to Sawyer about how he hoped they weren't too much too late. Tiana said that Celestial had arrived as well. Deera asked Tiana what they should do. She said that they had them surrounded. Stillwaters said that while they expected this to happen, things are going to get more complicated now. Ling Si said about Celestial and Wolf's Fang being allies. Sawyer struck with his fist and shattered Ruko's golden shield. Ling Si called out to Ruko. Sawyer told Blue Cloud that it took him long enough. Ruko punched his fist and gritted his teeth, thinking that the guild leader's buff had just ended. Sawyer told him that it was pretty strong. Ling Si told Ruko to hold on and about he was coming. A sniper rifle appeared in Darkfeather's hands and he told him to wait. He said it would be best for him to deal with Celestial first. Darkfeather said that they would have no chance of winning if they were sandwiched between guild number 3 and number 4. Looking through the telescopic sight, he said that he would support Ruko. A shot struck Sawyer's arm. His eye glowed red, and he said that this skill is quite something. He added that it still wasn't enough. Darkfeather appeared above him, firing two pistols and said that was enough for him to GG. Sawyer said about how they both came to die. Ling Si said that Darkfeather is really reliable. Coco Lai said that firearms are rare. Stillwaters said that everyone in Shadow is amazing, and he finally got a chance to see their abilities in person. Closing his eyes, he said that everything is exactly as Darkfeather said. He said that if Celestial entered the battle, their chances of winning would be practically nil. Stillwaters suggested hearing Ling Si's opinion on this first. As he looked at him, he thought that he wanted to see how well he handled the unexpected circumstances. He thought that all this time, he had surprised him again and again with his abilities and leadership skills, and he really wanted to see what his analytical abilities were like on the battlefield. Ling Si told him that now was not the time to test his analytical skills. Stillwaters said, Ah, you found me out, huh? That's not fun at all. The protagonist said that leading troops into battle is not his strongest suit, and Stillwaters might be better than him in that aspect. He added that he's keeping the team small for that reason. Ling Si, frowning, said that regardless of the type of battle, for him, the goal is extremely simple. He said that he needed to capture the ringleader to capture his followers. With a sideways glance, the protagonist said that it is still unclear whether the ringleader of this conflict is Wolf's Fang or Celestial. Stillwaters said that was to be expected from Ling Si. Coco Lai said that Celestial doesn't seem to be doing anything. Fallen Whale asked about them not going to do anything. Blue Cloud, folding his arms across his chest, asked why. He said to pass on his words, no one is allowed to do anything on their own without his orders. He said they would just stand there and watch. Fallen Whale asked about if they were here to give Wolf's Fang support. Blue Cloud, laughing, said that he only said he was coming, but he never said he would take part in this fight. Continuing to laugh, he said that coming to show his support for the Wolf's Fang Guild was already more than enough. Blue Cloud said that right now, Guild Number 3, Wolf's Fang, and Guild Number 5, Nebulous, were fighting. He asked about whether it wouldn't be unfair if they joined as well. Fallen Whale closed his eyes and thought to himself that it wasn't about fairness, but that he just didn't want to cut ties with Nebulous completely. Looking ahead, he thought that, more specifically, it was about this thief, Ling Si. Fallen Whale thought as he watched him, everything he had done in all this time and the resulting butterfly effect. He thought about how he alone was really slowly affecting the grand scheme of things in Heavenland. He thought about just how far he would go. Narlo asked about whether they had gotten here in this carriage. He said it looked very luxurious. With his hands in his pocket, he informed Blue Cloud that he had to say that if Celestial joined too, 
They would be ganging up on them with their numbers. Fallen Whale and Blue Cloud remained silent. The guy with the short hair asked what the guards were doing and how they let this stranger get so close to their guildmasters. The guy in armor asked if he knew who he was talking to. He asked where he got the nerve to say Blue Cloud's name. A sword appeared in Fallen Whale's hand and he said he didn't know what faction it belonged to. He told him if that was all he wanted to get out of their sight. He said he was insulting Blue Whale with his actions. Blue Cloud put his hand on Fallen Whale's shoulder and told Narlo that he hoped he was doing well. He told him with a wide smile not to worry because they, Celestial, will never pick on others. He asked since when did he have such a good relationship with Nebulus. Narlo replied that it can't be helped because his master is a member of Nebulus. Blue Cloud asked about the master. Fallen Whale thought with a grim face that Blue Cloud is diffusing things for this guy. He wondered why his name sounded so familiar. With a smile while pointing his finger at them, Narlo told them that he was now a person who had master so they couldn't touch him casually. Ling Si, appearing behind him with his back, angrily told him about looking everywhere for him. Hitting him on the head, he told him not to go picking fights at a time like this. Fallen Whale noticed that it was Ling Si. Blue Cloud, laughing, told him they hadn't seen each other in a while. The guy with the short hair asked the guards why they allowed another barge in. Ling Si, holding Narlo by the head, greeted Blue Cloud and said he came here to ask about Celestial's intentions for coming here. Blue Cloud said that as an ally of Wolf's Fang, he had things he couldn't do anything about. He told him not to worry because Celestial wouldn't take advantage of others' plight. Ling Si thought that this Blue Cloud was so polite that it seemed strange. He said with a smile that he was relieved to hear him say that. Dragging Narlo on the ground, the protagonist thanked Blue Cloud. He told Narlo to hurry up and stop making trouble. He told him to go with him to beat this Sawyer. Blue Cloud said they would see each other again. Pointing his finger at them, he ordered him to let them leave. Fallen Whale asked who it was. Blue Cloud asked if the name Narlo rings any bells. Closing his eyes, he said that his full name in real life was Narlo Delro. Fallen Whale asked in surprise if he was from Clan Delro, the richest ancient clan in the real world. Blue Cloud said that he'd entertain financial oligarchs and corporations of all sizes now and then, after all, they need their investment to develop the guild. He said that as a corporate representative of his clan, he often attends such meetings, and it seems that Narlo is a younger male descendant of the Delro clan, and he acts in a very unbridled manner. He said that he had heard that he had gotten bored, and he had let this squirrel from Wolfsfang hire him for a considerable price, and one of the reasons he had agreed to ally with Wolfsfang was because of his status. Fallen Whale tensely agreed and said that no one knows the exact extent of the Dalro clan's wealth and resources, and some even say that they control all the finances in the world. He added that on top of that, this clan also had a guild under their name, and it was the number one guild, Advent of Thousand Autumns. They looked at Ling Si, who was scolding the widely smiling Narlo. Sawyer yelled for Ruko to stop because he was the first person who had managed to last this many rounds against him. Dark Feather continued to fire pistols at him. Ruko, frowning, thought about the fact that besides the fact that his defense was incredibly high, but his attacks were also very strong, and it was as if his strength was getting stronger and stronger. He thought about whether it was possible that this was his special ability. Ruko thought that this was to be expected from someone who holds the position of guild leader, and it seems like he hasn't even shown all that he is capable of yet. Gritting his teeth, he cursed and thought that as a member of Shadow he couldn't dishonor Ling Si. Ling Si and Narlo appeared above Coco Lai and Stillwater's heads. The main character shouted that he was back. Coco Lai said that Ruko and Dark Feather couldn't break through his defense. Narlo said to leave it to them. Ling Si said with a smile that Celestial had no intentions of ganging up on them and they only came to watch. He said that they had found their purpose. Coco Lai replied with a smile that she understood, and then they shouldn't worry too much. Stillwaters said it had to be the one Tiana had said he gave up darkness for light, Narlo. He told them to show them what Shadow could do. Ling Si, calling out to Sawyer, asked about if he should be his target. Ruko, turning around, called out to Ling Si. The protagonist's eye was burning red, and he said with a confident smile that now that they had figured out the ringleader they should capture, he shouldn't blame them for not playing by the rules and attacking him in droves. 